Welcome to the latest edition of Health Matters, which focuses on the cardiovascular disease national ambitions, which will help save 150,000 hearts and minds. Too many people are still living with undetected and poorly managed atrial fibrillation, high blood pressure and raised cholesterol. Working with partners, Public Health England has agreed ambitions which, which seek to tackle the ABCs of secondary prevention and the health inequalities that they result in over the next 10 years. This is why partners have committed to ambitions in the detection and management of atrial fibrillation, the diagnosis and management of high blood pressure and the identification and management of raised cholesterol. We also have ambitions to reduce health inequalities by reducing the gap significantly in amenable cardiovascular disease morbidity and mortality between the most and the least deprived areas by 2029. How can we ensure that we meet these ambitions and the potential they offer to save lives across the population? With me today to discuss this is Dr Matt Kearney, National Clinical Director for Cardiovascular Disease Prevention at NHS England and Public Health England, Juliet Bouvry, who is Chief Executive of the Stroke Association, and Jenny Hargrave, who is the Director of Innovation and Health and Wellbeing from the British Heart Foundation. Matt, I'll start with you if I may. So as National Clinical Director for Cardiovascular Disease Prevention, what do these ambitions mean to you? What, what do you think they can allow us to achieve? The reason for doing it now and why it's in the long-term plan is because the burden of cardiovascular disease is so great. So 7 million people across the country suffer from cardiovascular disease. Uh, the cost, just in healthcare costs, is about £7 billion a year. We know it accounts for one in four of all deaths. And it's a major contributor to health inequalities. So 25% of the life expectancy gap between rich areas and poor areas is due to car cardiovascular disease. Um, but it's also very preventable, as we know. And of course, things like smoking and um, physical activity and diet, these are major contributors. And we know if we could improve those, we will reduce heart attacks and strokes and, and dementia. But we know also these high risk conditions atrial fibrillation, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, um, they all have a big effect in causing heart attacks and strokes are among the leading um, causes. We know that treatment, treating these conditions is really effective at preventing heart attacks and strokes, but what we also know is that they're underdiagnosed and they're undertreated. Lots of people are walking down this, around the streets unaware that these have these high risk conditions mm. or that they're not adequately um, controlled. Um, and international comparisons help us to understand actually just how much better we could do. So the Commonwealth Fund report of a year or so ago, this looked at the healthcare systems in the United Kingdom compared with other similar economies around the country. And as you'd expect, because we've got a great healthcare system in the UK, we did well and we're near the top, at the top or near the top in most of the things that were measured. But on health outcomes, actually we were next to last, mm. just behind the United States. And the reason for that, much of the reason, is our poor performance in, in cardiovascular disease. So I think the long-term plan um, is shedding a light on the real opportunity um, that we have. And it's going to focus on not just that we've got to do better, but how we can do things differently in order to improve outcomes for people at risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, partly that'll be about mobilising communities to do things differently. Part of it's using the wider primary care workforce to improve outcomes for patients by diagnosing and managing these conditions earlier, but at the same time taking um, burden off um, general practice. So topping all of this now, we have these, this really bold ambition, 150,000 heart attacks and strokes to prevent over 10 years. And we're setting clear aims for atrial fibrillation, high blood pressure and high cholesterol, um, clear ambitions of what we're going to aim to achieve in order to deliver that 150,000. So I think really exciting, bold ambition. Thank you. So Juliet, as um, Chief Executive of the Stroke Association, what do these ambitions mean to you and your organisation? Well, as Matt sort of said, um, stroke's one of the biggest health challenges of our time. It's the fourth biggest killer in the UK. It's the single biggest cause of complex adult disability. And as a consequence, it costs the NHS, the state, individuals and their families unnecessary distress and money as well. 
But the good news about stroke is it is preventable. Nine out of 10 strokes are found to be preventable. And we know what the two main risk factors are for stroke, which is high blood pressure and atrial fibrillation. And I thought I might just talk a little bit about atrial fibrillation because a lot of people um, don't really know what it is and don't know how prevalent and how treatable it is. So atrial fibrillation is a form of irregular heartbeat. It actually affects as many as 1.4 million people in the UK and it's a major risk factor for a stroke. You are five times more likely to have a stroke if you have atrial fibrillation and unfortunately you're more likely to have a severe stroke if you have AF. Now the good news is we know exactly what works in terms of effective detection and management of AF. And we now have excellent anticoagulant treatments, which means that people can live really well long term with this condition. But the reality is it's both not well managed in a large proportion of that population. And there are about half a million people in the UK wandering around who don't yet have their AF detected. So we're calling on uh, GPs and different parts of the system to focus on AF detection and management. We've got some great examples through the academic health science networks who've really spearheaded change in this area. And we've set ourselves a bold ambition, which is in 10 years time, we want nearly 20,000 AF related strokes to be prevented. And that in turn will also prevent the avoidance of other cardiovascular incidents. So Jenny, um, in your role as Director of Innovation and Health and Wellbeing at the British Heart Foundation, what do you make of these ambitions? Do you think they're bold? And I think they're bold and I think actually having a tangible ambition that you can actually work towards, that everybody is signed up to, actually helps to create that social movement. It helps to create that shared narrative, that shared ambition, um, that you can then frame the activities and the deliverables and the opportunity to make a difference around. So we're all working towards that common goal. It's probably worth knowing that um, of the, uh, the b blood pressure ambitions, um, five million people in England currently, right now, are undetected. They're walking around with high blood pressure, they don't know they have it, and if they did know they have it, they might not even know why it's important. Because as Juliet said, it's one of the major causes, it is probably the major cause of heart attacks and strokes, um, ad ad aligned with atrial fibrillation and high cholesterol. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's incredibly important. Secondly, there's the, the ambitions around high cholesterol. In particular, if we actually focus in on one element, there is a condition, a genetically inherited condition called familial hypercholesterolemia. Um, and that affects one in 270 people. That's a lot of people. That's over 220,000 in, in England alone um, who are walking around and only 5% of those know that they have it. And the reason why it's important to know that they have it is because if it's treated, if it's detected and treated optimally, they will live a normal life like the rest of the population. Untreated, undetected, um, they are not likely to live beyond the age, or a, a significant proportion will, will live to the age of 50 or 60 maximum, some die much younger than that. So it's a really significant uh, health risk and that's so easy to treat, it's actually really, really important to know. So having an ambition around cholesterol, but also then having a specific ambition around the genetic causes of high cholesterol is, is incredibly important. Juliet, so we've set out these bold ambitions and we've got many partners working with us in, in now making these real, but what is it the Stroke Association is going to do to help us achieve these? So there's a number of things that we're going to do and we've just agreed our new strategy for the next 10 years and that includes a focus on prevention, working in partnership with other actors in the system and really driving for population level impacts and in particular targeting support to communities that we know are most at risk of stroke. Um, we know that people in more socio-economically deprived areas, people from certain BME communities are more likely to have a stroke, so we'll be targeting our support on those areas. We're also working closely with the integrated care systems and we've set up a community of practice so that the integrated care systems can be learning and sharing and adopting the pr best practice and becoming exemplars for the implementation of our CVD ambitions. And then finally, through our own services, because we have a network of over 300 services all across the UK, where stroke coordinators are providing essential 
information and support to help people with their recovery. Through those services, we provide a lot of information and advice about secondary prevention. Because if you've had a stroke, you are unfortunately at risk of other strokes. And so it's so important that you're adopting a healthy lifestyle, you're taking your medication appropriately, you're aware of what the risk factors are and what you can do about them. So through our own services, we hope to be supporting secondary prevention as well as primary prevention. Great. So Matt, we know that there's huge variation across the country and there'll be some areas that haven't got too far to go to reach these ambitions, but there'll be some that actually there's a long way to go. What would you say to those that, that are setting out in probably what is quite a long and what appears to be a difficult journey? I think we've identified three, three pillars of improvement um, that you really need to have in place. And if you're setting out, you've got to work at the pillars. And the first pillar is data. You need robust, real-time data that tells you how are we currently performing. Now, QOF data might be the best you've got, but lots of places now they have data shared across practices and are getting better at analysing, looking at how well and they're performing. The second area is leadership, clinical leadership. And I know when we've, mm -hmm. we've spoken to people in Canada, they identified yeah. clinical leadership was absolutely key yeah. to making this happen. Yeah. Local clinicians, GPs like myself, need to own this and say this is our problem we want to do something about it. And the third pillar is doing things differently. Mm -hmm. General practice is struggling under the workload at the moment. Um, it's a very busy, complex place, the GP consultation. We're not going to improve this stuff by getting GPs to work harder or faster. So it's about where this has been successful, as in Lambeth or Cheshire and Merseyside, is because they've done things differently. Mm -hmm. Mobilising that wider workforce of pharmacists, etc., um, to help out. So I think if, um, if areas are considering, and I guess most areas will be considering taking this on, it's in the long-term plan. For most integrated care systems, cardiovascular disease prevention is a priority um, already. It is already there that you can use. Great. Mm -hmm. So Jenny, finally, um, you're part of the system leadership forum that we've established. Yep. I think we've got probably getting close 35. to 40, yeah, 30, mm -hmm. 40 partners around the table. Um, but what is it the BHF will do to really help us deliver against these ambitions? Um, I think one of the challenges and one of the opportunities that the, the, the charity sector have is to really create the, the, the context and the space to have that innovative conversation, to consider where the challenges are and to start looking at potentially pump priming some of those solutions. And pump priming isn't always money. It can be about bringing the right people together. It can be about connecting. It can be all sorts of, of reasons. So that's, a, that's, that's probably a key one. And I, I don't think that is just the BHF Stroke Association do it. We've actually done something in partnership yeah. historically, haven't we, quite a few times. So, um, so I think that there's that. Um, I think um, one of the other things that we saw as an emerging theme probably three years ago was the opportunity to really test the, that sort of non-medical model, which is the community mobilisation element of it. So we um, we have now got 15 pilot sites um, working across the UK um, who are really testing different models that um, are designed to reach and test um, individuals in the community, giving them access to blood pressure testing. Um, again, building on some of the, the great work that the Stroke Association has done. This is, we haven't started this from scratch. Um, and in fact, you know, we have representation on our steering group, um, and that's really looking at um, how things can be done differently. So there are some really great examples already emerging of building um, options on to um, fire and rescue service safe and well programmes. Mm barber shops, um, places where there is quite a lot of footfall of, of the type of individual who is unlikely or least likely to take up health checks, um, so football stadiums, um, community context, and wide, wide range of community context. And what we're finding is that there's some really good and strong emerging thinking, but it's not just seeing that happening in those individual 15 pockets, it's them bringing them together evaluating iteratively 
taking the learning from those, sharing that across the system so that those programs are evolving as the evaluation continues. And I think that's an incredibly important um, context to build on uh, because that's how we can then share learning and, and really develop the spread and adoption. I think one of the most important parts of that is that we have patients and the public involved in the design, not just the health system, but it is also then considering the barriers and the opportunities to implementation. I'm afraid we've come to the end of our time, but I would like to thank our expert panel for joining me today. Public Health England and its partners are committed to reducing cardiovascular disease morbidity and mortality. We have heard that by meeting these ambitions, we could potentially prevent 150,000 heart attacks, strokes and dementia cases over the next 10 years, reducing the burden on the NHS and social care. We know that other countries such as Canada are already exceeding in the management of these conditions and other areas in England are also making great and strong progress. Nevertheless, there is still a huge gap in CVD, morbidity and mortality between our richest and poorest communities yeah. and we need to address and take action on this urgently. Existing mechanisms such as the NHS Health Check and new models of delivery which puts pharmacists in general practice put England in a good and strong position to achieve these ambitions. Please do take time to explore this edition of Health Matters, which includes links to a variety of practical tools, infographics, case studies and blogs.